Yeah, so like Cindy said, um, I'm the Human Wildlife Interactions Advisor with the UC Extension, and today I'm going to be talking about attracting beneficial birds for pest control on farms. And so we know that wildlife plays um, an important role in providing a variety of ecosystem services on farms that enhance sustainability, farm viability. Um, and so today I'm really going to be talking about how to um, enhance natural pest control um, through the use of songbird nest boxes, barn owl nest boxes, American kestrel nest boxes, and raptor perches. And so first I'm gonna talk about insect pest control from songbirds. And this can inc include a variety of species depending on where you are and the particular habitat surrounding your farm. This, um, over here we have an ash-throated flycatcher, a western bluebird, which is going to be more common, um, a house wren, which is going to be more common in um, riparian areas. So it just depends on um, where you are. Um, another bird that's really common that's not pictured here are swallows, so tree swallows, sometimes violet green swallows will all contribute to the natural pest control. And so the question is, do songbirds really help with pests? And there's been a variety of research showing the um, net benefit. So that's taking in the costs and benefits and weighing them together and showing that, yeah, they really can have a positive impact on pest control. Um, and so one, some studies looked at their um, droppings and they used DNA to tell what sort of um, prey these birds were eating. And a recent study showed that um, songbirds um, on farms were consuming a wide variety of different insects and arthropods in their diet, um, and that they were targeting species that were abundant. And what's important to know about that is that that's thought to allow them to respond and assist with pest outbreaks. So when pests become really common, we know that um, birds can be targeting those and um, helping us that way. Um, another research project in California vineyards showed that bluebirds uh, con diet consisted of greater than 50% herbivorous insects. So aphids, leaf hoppers, moss, and even other pests like mosquitoes. Um, and then, Songbirds feed their young a diet of insects, so by increasing breeding on, um, and nest box density in a given area, you can increase foraging by parents that are feeding their young in those areas. And I always like to point out that pests can be seasonal, so, um, so some bird species that become pests in the fall, like blackbirds or starlings, things that flock up and can cause damage to pests, they're still contributing to beneficial pest control in the spring because they are feeding their young a diet of insects. So over here, I have a blackbird collecting um, these caterpillars that are a pest in the sunflower crop. Although later in the season, they may flock up and become pests. So it's important to keep in context the timing and seasonality when we're thinking about pest control. Let's see, okay. So next I wanna talk about songbird nest box installation. And the best time to do this is in late summer or fall. And that way boxes will be ready for birds to find and start um, prospecting in winter and spring and be ready to um, be used that next breeding season. You can install these boxes in riparian areas, orchards, vineyards, um, the edges of fields, or um, but you want to keep them out of the way of farm equipment, especially considering where if sprinklers are present and if there's any other spraying that takes place. If you're hanging your boxes within a field, you want to make sure that it's not going to be um, in the direct line of any sort of spraying or farm equipment or getting in the way that way. When you're placing these nest boxes, you should avoid facing them towards roads or hanging them right on the edge of roads, parking lots, or areas with um, moderate to high human activity. And if you have, if you do know if there's outdoor cats in the area, you might want to move your boxes away from those areas. And that's just because um, cats can, they can um, attack the young 
birds, once they fledge the nest, they're not going to be very smart and coordinated. And so um, they can be really vulnerable to predators at that time. And cats can really key in on, on songbirds. Um, you also want to consider if there's constant noise or bright lights at night, and maybe move those boxes away from those areas. Um, because those are some things that have been shown to negatively affect breeding. And if we are going to be investing, in putting these boxes out, maintaining them, um, we want to make sure we get the best return on them. And so um, just keeping in mind these little things that you can do to help increase breeding in these boxes. And I also want to point out that there's going to be more research coming on this soon. Um, there's some active research projects now looking at um, best places to hang boxes, and um, I should have more information on this in the future. Another thing to consider is um, protecting the young and the nest boxes from predators. And so by hanging boxes on poles, fences, or hanging from a tree branch, not directly on a tree trunk, um, you can limit the predators that can access the box. You can also, if you are using hanging them on a pole, you can use um, something like a baffle and a variety of materials can be used to make something like this. I've even seen um, an Ikea trash can. <laughs> um, and the other um, things that you can use if you're just hanging them on a pole are these um, entrance extenders, and it's just going to prevent things from being able to reach in and um, uh, access nestlings that are helpless in the nest box. Um, you also want to take into account the size of the opening. And when you're attracting different songbirds, the size of the opening can limit larger predators. So you really just want the size that is just big enough for the birds that you're trying to attract. And um, by choosing areas with afternoon shade, you can prevent these boxes from um, overheating in, he in heat waves or just in the afternoon sun. And if they're not going to be shaded in the afternoon, either by trees or buildings, you can use um, sun shields or, and you can also drill little holes for ventilation. And these are sort of the types of things that you can find um, it with information for nest box plans. And so I listed some really good resources for songbird nest boxes. We have the Wild Farm Alliance uh, website. They have uh, a video series where um, researchers from all over the country are talking about best practices for um, the things that I kind of just covered. And so they go into a lot more depth. And there is a Cornell Nest Watch page. This is where you can find a variety of nest box plans. So the um, typical songbird box for bluebirds and tree swallows is on there. You can find information about predator guards. And if you're specifically interested in bluebirds, there's the Bluebird Recovery Program website here. Um, so next I'm gonna cover vertebrate pest control from raptors. And uh, when, I, when I say raptor, I mean a variety of species comprised of hawks, owls, falcons, eagles, harriers, and kites. And uh, what I wanna point out is that raptors are going to be targeting mostly vertebrate pests. So most raptors eat voles, gophers, and mice, and there's some variation. So some smaller species like American kestrels are gonna eat some insects and also songbirds as well. And larger species like golden eagles, they're going to target things like ground squirrels and rabbits. Um, it also depends on the season and the location and the habitat around a given area for what species are going to show up. So you can um, also, um, there's also lots of great resources on the Cornell website about um, about life history of birds when they might when you might see them and also um, where they might be. And if you have any further questions about this, you can also ask me um, personally. The um, other concept that I really like to bring up when I talk about um, vertebrate pest control from raptors is the concept, the landscape of fear. And so the benefit of having top predators around is not that they're going to necessarily be consuming so many pest species, that it um, reduces populations and reduces damage in that way. They're not gonna be um, consuming every last single pest. What they're going to be doing 
is um, scaring their prey. And this can cause a shift in prey behavior and is also shown to reduce pest activity. So when we talk about vertebrate pest control from raptors, we're not just talking about direct consumption, we're also talking about this landscape of fear concept. There's been some research looking at barn owls and um, other raptor species and um, how much and do they actually help with pests? And so a few um, species have shown that barn owls are correlated with decreased pest activity and increased yields. And in Israel, they looked at fields with and without um, barn owls, and they were able to measure a 3% increase in yields um, in fields that had barn owls present over a long period of time. There's been a lot of really great research out of the Cal Poly Humboldt barn owl research team. And one of the things um, the um, their team looked at was um, how many rodents are barn owls killing. And they found that uh, over a breeding season, a family is eating thousands and thousands of rodents. So about 3,500 rodents in a single breeding season per um, nest. Other research in the Sacramento Valley looked at what barn owls were eating and found that across different crop types, their diet was 99% rodent pests, mostly gophers, voles, and mice. But what was important to note was that in areas with higher proportion of row crops, mice were a more prevalent prey item. And in areas with um, a higher proportion of orchards and vineyards and perennial crops, barn owls ate more gophers. And so this is also evidence that they're targeting common prey species and able to assist in um, instances of pest outbreaks. Another um, really great research project out of the um, Cal Poly Humboldt team is that they looked at um, gopher activity in February and May, and they found that in areas that did not have um, an active barn owl nest box, gopher activity increased um, by 18%, but in um, Areas that had an active nest box in February, they had pretty high gopher activity, but by the time those nestlings were um, hatched and the parents were working to feed them, they did see that gopher activity had decreased in those areas. There's also some research showing that natural pest control from raptors can be more cost effective than purchasing and applying rodenticides. And in Southern California, they had a um, levy where they put barn owl nest boxes and raptor perches and a second levy where they used rodenticides to target ground squirrels that were, um, they were causing damage and um, burrowing under the levy there. And they found that the areas with the barn owl nest boxes and raptor perches actually had a, um, greater decrease in pest damage compared to using rodenticides. So they ended up switching and putting the nest boxes and perches across um, all of the levees. And then in Malaysia, in oil palm, they looked at using rodenticides versus using barn owl nest boxes, and they measured fruit damage in their oil palm crops. They found that um, barn owls reduced damage from pests just as much as the areas that had rodenticides applied, but it was a much cheaper and cost-effective way to reduce pest damage. And then lastly, um, we do know that um, just the, there's been a big push for brands that have sustainable or wildlife-friendly certifications. And so um, these are these this research sort of sort of shows how. Um, natural pest control can contribute in a meaningful way to becoming to um, operations becoming sustainable and wildlife friendly. So let's talk a little bit about barn owl nest box networks. Um, and I want to start by talking about um, some natural history about barn owls. They're really unique among birds because they have a really, really long breeding season. We might typically think, oh, birds, they will nest in spring, but not barn owls. They start laying their eggs as early as January. And in some years, if the climate and the prey um, abundances are just right, they may even start nesting as early as November or December in California. 
And so um, they're, I also like to point this out because they're using the nest boxes for an extremely long period of time. And um, that's why I point out in future slides how we want to pay careful attention to how we're um, maintaining and taking care of these nest boxes because they are kind of tied to these for quite a long period of time. So the barn owl pairs will incubate eggs for a month. And then once those eggs hatch, nestlings take another two months before they can leave the box and start to um, fend for themselves. And then not only is it, so that's about a three month period, not only um, there might not just be one nest, um, once a nest finishes, another parents can initiate and start another nest. So they can fit two um, uh, nests into a single year often. Um, so we also looked at, um, over here is a map of California, and we looked at regions that had barn owl nest boxes, and we wanted to look at the timing that eggs were laid and how that might vary across different regions, different climates, different habitats. Oops. And um, so what we did find was that in the green Central Valley and the yellow Southern um, California areas, we did see that nests were initiated, eggs were laid a few weeks earlier than in the, um, the coastal mountain area over here. And so that's important just to think about, you know, the timing of when boxes are being used. Um, and so we also looked at the months that eggs were laid and so these gray bars here are the estimated egg laying dates of barn owls in California. And um, it shows that in winter, so December, January and, January and February, we're actually having the bulk of barn owl nests being initiated. So 63%. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a second. Um, but they are still initiating a lot of nests in spring and then summer and fall, you have the um, lowest breeding activity. Um, and so you also want to um, keep in mind other um, nest box design as, uh, characteristics that will prioritize um, nestling safety by um, preventing predators. So you can install boxes on a metal pole. Um, the front should have grooves here and um, an appropriately sized opening. So just large enough for a barn owl, but small enough for any other um, birds to fly in. And then there's this little partition um, here in this design by the entrance, and that will prevent any uh, like a mammal from reaching their arm in and uh, being able to access the nestlings that way. Also having the hole closer to the top is an important thing because um, uh, as the barn owls are in the box for months on end, they are regurgitating pellets. So barn owls will consume their prey whole and they have all of these really strong digestive enzymes and um, they uh, regurgitate pellets that are bones and fur that were not digested. And so those things build up and they end up raising the floor up. And so if that floor it becomes too close to the entrance, nestlings will kind of crowd around that entrance waiting for their parents to come and feed them. And nestlings can get pushed out or they can fall out. Um, and so by having a greater distance between the opening and the floor, um, we can prevent that from happening. Also, larger boxes are going to allow nestlings to flap their wings and start stretching out before they um, before they leave the box. And this is going to increase their um, coordination and their um, their strength before they have to be outside of the box where they're more vulnerable to predators. To mitigate for heat, especially if your boxes are hanging on poles with no trees nearby, um, there are these um, sun panels that um, will prevent the um, or lower the temperature of have they can help lower the temperature of the box by um, preventing direct sun from hitting and um, just kind of shining on the box all day. Um, facing the openings north or east is going to um, uh, orient the box towards the sun so that it's not coming directly into the entrance. And then if you have those heat shields, then um, those will be facing south or west into where the sun shines at the hottest time of the day. 
And there are some barn owl nest box plans that you can access on Wild Farm Alliance website. Um, there's also a really great resource for kind of the Bay Area, North Bay Area, um, BOMCO. They have um, services and uh, plans and they they can do a wide variety of things such as advise you where to put the boxes, how many to put. They will monitor and clean out the boxes for a fee. And that could be a really great way to get a successful nest box network um, started with their expertise. Um, but it's not available in every area. So if you don't have access to this, you can also contact other people. You can um, email me and I can try to point you in the right direction of resources. Just like Songbird nest boxes, you do want to install boxes in um, uh, before the following breeding season, so by late summer and fall. They may take a little while to become colonized. Uh, it depends on the barn owl population in the area, and this is why we always recommend more than one box. So a nest box network is going to be important to support um, a breeding population in a given area and also allow owls in that area to find boxes nearby and will keep those boxes being occupied and used. Um, barn owls are kind of open country hunters, so they really like grasslands, oak savannas, and open crop types, so um, vineyards or other um, forage or row crops um, can be good areas for barn owls or even the edges of orchards. Um, and they are not very territorial, so barn owl nest boxes can be pretty close. They can be 100 to 300 feet apart, um, and they can tip it, we typically recommend that they're hung 9 to 10 feet high, and that's so that you can access them for um, maintenance. Uh, you also want to avoid putting your boxes in dense forests, so you can do the edges of forests or out in the open, which we recommend. Um, and then you also want to uh, you also want to avoid busy roads um, and roads with either a lot of traffic or heavy or high, fast speed limits. And then some people say that if they have a barn owl nest box outside of their house, if they can hear it, they may be able to hear it from their bedroom window if they're sleeping with their windows open. And so that's one thing to consider if you are placing nest boxes, but um, that is personal preference. And um, there's an, another research um, project that I wanna highlight from the Cal Poly Humboldt team is that um, they are, barn owls are, so they put these little trackers on um, barn owls um, for a week and looked at what areas they were spending their time in. And they were really, um, and this is in Napa, so there's a lot of vineyards and grasslands, and, and that's really what they um, ended up preferring. And so I do want to point out that even if they're not hunting directly in your crops where you have a problem, they are probably hunting around the edges and can be preventing pest um, invasions from other areas because they really, really like to um, pick off young dispersing gophers and voles. And so um, that can also be a benefit of uh, barn owls, even if they're not hunting directly in a crop field. And so um, kestrels are another raptor. So I wanna move on to talking about how to support um, kestrels with nest boxes. And the resource for um, this is the American Kestrel Partnership page. And um, they're going to have all sorts of information from nest boxes to where to hang them and um, other considerations, how to monitor them as well. Um, kestrels are a smaller falcon, like I said earlier. And so in addition to eating rodents, such as mice and voles, they're they're going to eat smaller prey as well. So insects, birds, and reptiles. Um, and there's some active research on American kestrel diet in um, agricultural lands in the Central Valley. And um, some preliminary results do show that they are consuming pest insects as well, just like the songbirds. And so I'll have more information on that in the future once those studies come out. Um, another study in cherry orchards in uh, Michigan showed that nesting kestrels, um, they worked sort of through that landscape of fear concept in um, reducing songbird abundance. And those so um, songbirds were um, 
fruit eating birds and causing damage to the cherry crop. And so by having Keschel nest boxes in those cherry orchards, they were able to deter fruit eating songbirds and they saw a measurable economic benefit in their cherry crop. Um, this is just a picture of what a Kestrel nest box looks like. It's slightly different and less complicated than a barn owl nest box. And um, it also has certain mitigations like um, ha for predators. So having their opening up towards the top um, and appropriately sized limits um, larger predator predators from entering the box and also reaching down, um, they're less likely to reach the birds that are are going to be down at the bottom of the box. Um, so these boxes can also be installed in late summer and fall. Um, and then I really, Keschels are a species that's not as common as barn owls or in high abundance as barn owls. So if you want to know if Keschels um, are starting a Kestrel nest box network on your property is um, appropriate, you can um, ask local bird experts or you can ask me, but it, it's not gonna be as ubiquitous as barn owls. So they, they, they're a little bit more um, picky in what areas they, they like. And so um, they like open areas and so, like grasslands and oak savannas, just like barn owls, um, but they're more territorial and secretive. So the boxes should be spaced out pretty far um, and they they could also be hung about nine to 10 feet high. Yeah, so in terms of forests or riparian areas, they can be on the edges of those, but you don't wanna have them on the interiors of forests. Um, avoid areas with human activity, even um, just because kestrels are out during the day, they're going to be more sensitive to um, people and activity going on around nest boxes. Barn owls, because they're nocturnal, they're going to be hunkered down in their box and, and there's going to really have to be a lot of activity outside of those boxes to disturb them because uh, they're kind of just going to hunker down and their defense behavior is to kind of stay hidden. Whereas kestrels, because they're out during the day, um, they're going to be more sensitive if people are walking by or driving by constantly. So we want to keep those uh, um, in more quiet areas, also away from roads. And other species may take up kestrel nest boxes, depending on where you are. So this is a picture of a western screech owl and her three fluffy um, nestlings here. Um, they're going to also be beneficial in terms of pest control. Other species that like this size box are northern flickers and, and other native songbirds like the ash throat of flycatcher I showed will sometimes be found um, nesting in these boxes. A common problem, though, is that starlings will take up these boxes. And so that's why I recommend the monitoring um, system that American Kestrel Partnership recommends. And they also have information about if you find starlings nesting in your box, how you can um, prevent that from happening in the future. So through moving boxes or taking them down or just um, there's uh, a lot of good ideas on that page. And so um, now I want to talk a little bit in general about nest box cleaning and maintenance. And um, all nest boxes should be inspected yearly in late summer to fall. And especially for barn owls, that's why, since they do have such a long breeding season, that's why it was important to look at, you know, when is breeding activity the lowest? And so that's in that late summer to fall period, which also aligns with other birds who commonly nest in spring. They're typically also done nesting by late summer and fall. And so that's a pretty safe time to check boxes, look for um, deterioration in hardware and make sure that they're safe and functional. Um, Kest uh, Kestrel nest boxes and barn owl boxes will have those pel that pellet debris building up. Kestrels do make pellets. They're not as big and prominent as barn owls, but th they'll also have some stuff building up. And so cleaning that out and replacing with um, some wood shavings um, once it starts to build up is important. And um, smaller barn owl boxes. So here I have pictured is only like a 16 or 18 inch high box. These ones are going to be really important to monitor and clean out yearly if there's active nests. But in those taller boxes that I was showing earlier in a 24-inch box, those can sometimes 
um, go uh, one or two nest cycles without, you know, building up too high to become detrimental. Um, and so that is another reason why we recommend those larger boxes. And then in terms of nest, uh, songbird nest boxes, they should also be um, cleaned out. They will build, bring in materials to build nests and um, those can also build up. Uh, and so having those boxes clean and ready for the next um, year will increase breeding success uh, in your nest boxes. And this is just kind of to show, so if you look at these pictures here, um, this box on the right had an active barn owl nest in there, although the bottom is about to fall out. And so that was really disheartening to see, you know, if we're going to be um, putting up these um, nest box networks, it's, there is some responsibility to make sure that they stay safe. And also, if you know, you're investing your time and money, you're going to want to make sure you have the best return on your investment. And so keeping those safe and functional is the best way to do that. Um, and this is just a couple more points about maintenance um, and why it should be completed before winter. And so I know fall is a very busy time. And so thinking about how this fits into your annual kind of time budget is going to be really important. Um, but by doing that, you're going to um, ensure that you don't disturb nests in, that are in, starting in the winter. You're going to prevent um, birds from starting nests in overfilled or unsafe boxes. Um, and then lastly, if you have an unoccupied box that you see is broken or damaged, you can fix that at any time of the year. But I know that um, if you have a large network, it, it's something that should be looked at um, annually. All right, so on to raptor purchase. Um, a variety of diurnal and nocturnal raptor species can be attracted to perch and hunt from these artificial perches. And they can be um, in or around fields. And the other, the other thing that I just want to highlight again is that, remember, it's not that they're going to be consuming every single last pest, but they're going to have their presence uh, of a top predator, and that's going to um, reduce prey activity and in turn reduce damage. Um, and then when when they are consumed, what they do, because we know that they do consume um, common species, um, and which are likely to be pests. Um, it means that they can, that they're kind of like present and vigilant, and then they can respond and reduce the severity of pest outbreaks. And we know it's probably not going to be the only solution. There's going to be other um, things that need to be taken into account, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, it, but increasing natural pest control um, through raptors can be beneficial in term in in these times of pest outbreaks. So like voles, for example, I know that they have like a cyclical pattern to their population. And so in some years they just reach really, really high densities. And so already having a high raptor um, pop or a large raptor population on your landscape can help to buffer damage that might happen from outbreaks like that. Perch construction and installation. So a variety of construction can work a variety of materials or ways to put them together. You can get creative. They don't need to be as sturdy or maintained as nest boxes because, um, so as you could see this golden eagle here on this perch, um, jumping off this perch and it's swaying and it, it doesn't seem to be bothering it and it, it doesn't pose any sort of danger either because they're not gonna be sleeping in these or you know, tied to these for a very long period of time. If something happens, it, they can, fly away easily. Um, and so where we recommend to put um, raptor perches is in areas where um, raptors have the best view of the landscape. And so that is gonna be, if your property is on a hill or has like rolling hills or on slopes, you're gonna wanna put them at the top of hills and at ridge lines. You wanna, um, you don't need to put raptor perches directly near riparian areas or forests because trees are natural perching substrate. Um, so you can use those really in the middle of crop fields, in the middle of vineyards to make, to um, allow raptors to perch at the highest point on the landscape and they'll have a good um, vantage for hunting there. 
You can also put them in problem areas. So if you have ground squirrel colonies or um, other things, you can um, increase your perch density in those areas. And it's likely that you're going to need more than one raptor perch. So if you have a large property, you put up one raptor perch, they may or may not use it, but it it's not going to necessarily be effective unless you're kind of increasing that perching substrate across um, the area. To construct raptor perches, um, like I said, it can be a variety of materials, but uh, one way you can make it is through using a galvanized steel pole or pipe as small as uh, three quarter inch. And a, you're going to, you want to use a wooden crossbeam. So this is an old scrap wood from a wine barrel. And um, we recommend wood because metal can heat up in the um, during the day. And, and so we want to make sure that it's um, not going to burn their feet. Other research has looked at perch height and shown that 15 feet is a really great height that they, they use that more than perches that were 20 feet or perches that were 10 feet. And so these can be um, Poles can be seated in the ground. You can use concrete. They can also be attached to if you have a secure fence post, and I'll show some pictures of that in a minute. And like I said, the place in the highest areas, hilltops and ridgelines, and away from trees. So here's some examples. Let's see, um, this vineyard here has a rolling hillside along um, one of the edges of their property, and so they have a perch here um, at the top of each of these um, hills. Oops. And this is, you can't really see it's kind of cut off, but there's a, a ridge line that goes along here and there's about every two to 300 feet, there's a perch along the along this ridge line and, and they are um, often used. So the reason why ridge lines are really great is because raptors will um, use the thermals and the, the wind to kind of, to raise up and then that's why they, um, it reduces the energy that they need to fly to get to these. So they use that often. Um, here's another perch. So there's other trees and orchards nearby, but if you had, you know, a ground squirrel colony along this fence line, this is something that's gonna give a raptor a highest, uh, a higher um, vantage point than anywhere in the surrounding area. Here's an example of attaching those um, perch poles to a secure fence post. And I do like to point out that raptor, or sorry, that barn owl boxes make really great raptor perches. So if you have a really good network of barn owl boxes, you um, already have you already have a lot of raptor perches because they you'll even so a lot of these nest boxes are active with barn owl nests but you still see red tails kestrels even golden eagles perching from them and hunting and you know sometimes they'll even bring their prey back and and eat it on top of the box and they'll leave guts and stuff and it's kind of gross but um you but they can be used as perches as well okay so the last thing that i want to touch on and then we can open it up for questions is that um, is the idea of integrated pest management and that you know raptors aren't and songbirds aren't going to be the ultimate solution to every single pest problem. Um, it's nice to enhance natural pest control because, it, like I said, it can um, be important in times of pest outbreak. It can um, have a background level of um, pest control that is beneficial, um, but you may need to use other methods as well. And um, ideally methods would work together in an additive way to reduce pests, but not all methods, um, some methods can interact with each other. So it's important to consider non-target effects of other um, control methods. And so um, one example that I like to point out is the use of anticoagulant rodenticides. And so we would hope that if anticoagulant rodenticides were used that Raptors and rodenticides um, both add to rodent pest control, but what we know is that um, anticoagulant rodenticides can enter the food chain and also impact predators that are eating um, rodents that maybe consume this bait. And so by doing that, you could also be negatively 
um, either lethally or um, non-lethally negatively impacting raptors, their ability to hunt or reproduce in a given area. And it could be kind of counterproductive. So we're working so hard to increase natural pest control, but this could also act to reduce natural pest control if we're having this sort of interaction. Um, and so in a, in a wide variety of studies looking at exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides in top predators, so mammals and raptors, um, over 75% of um, animals had some sort of exposure. And um, so it's pretty widespread. It doesn't necessarily always lead to mortality of the predator, um, but we and we do know that there it can lead to mortality and that it also can have other negative impacts, like I was saying, on breeding or just hunting behavior in general. And not all anticoagulant rodenticides are created equally. There's second generation anticoagulant rodenticides um, that pose a greater risk to predators. They are made to be more toxic than the first generation ARs because of, um, of rodents becoming immune to first generation ARs. Um, the, these second generation ARs will persist longer in the tissues and also rodents can consume more than one lethal dose resulting in a higher um, exposure to the predators. So um, that's, we just like to point out that um, different things have different interactions and it, so it's important to take into account the whole picture when thinking about um, controlling pests in on the landscape. And so with that, I'd like to just end with saying that, you know, um, by promoting birds and um, natural pest control through nest boxes and perches, um, you know, it really is a win-win for um, farms and also wildlife because um, a lot of these things, nesting substrate, perching substrate have become limited. Uh, and so by increasing these things, we can also help wildlife and um and kind of replace some of the things that are lacking. And so, yeah, I guess with that, I can take any questions. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Brianna, for your great presentation. So just, um, I guess I didn't make it as clear in the beginning. Brianna is new to her position. So she is located out of Napa um, office, but she is here um, for your questions and she is here as an advisor in our counties now, which is a great addition to our group. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Michelle. You do have some questions in the Q&A. Yeah, the first question is um, any tips on supporting white-shouldered kites and hawks? Um, yeah, so those, so one thing that I didn't touch on is using um, natural habitat and large trees around um, crop areas in order to um, promote uh, other raptor species. So kestrels and barn owls are cavity nesters, and so that's why they use nest boxes. But white-tailed kites, red-tailed hawks, uh, red-shouldered hawks, and Cooper's hawks, lots of other really beneficial raptors will use trees to build stick nests. And so um, by, you know, having those sorts of things around, you can also promote the nesting of other raptors. Um, and then for white-tailed kites in particular, they don't need very large trees. They'll nest in some like small, like pretty large shrubs and small trees as well. So um, and if you have those in the area, just by providing habitat, I think in addition to the crops would be a really good way to start supporting them. Yeah. Is it better to place a barn owl box near trees or in open space? Yeah. So this is, this is going to be um, context dependent. And, and the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of research showing that the barn owl nest boxes, they will track with the outside temperature. And so we can benefit by placing them near trees with the shade of the trees, but um, sometimes great horn owls will be more present in those wooded areas and they are really aggressive and territorial. They also provide pest control, but barn owls will nest in um, nest boxes out in the open as well. And then that kind of brings them away from those forested areas. So I think 
if you have um, a really open area with just a little bit of forest, I would place them away from those forested areas and do other things like heat shields or the sun panels. Um, but if you do have a lot of forest and putting it out in the open isn't really going to increase that distance between the forest and the barn owl box, you know, it's still going to be pretty close, then I would say putting it on the edge of a treed area is going to be fine. So because barn owls and great horned owls, they do interact and coexist. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a trade off. And um, but if you have more questions about it, feel free to contact me. Um, are there any specific requirements to nesting boxes for barn owls versus other owl species? Yes, barn owl nest boxes are pretty specific to the ones that I talked about today. Um, other owls are that use nest boxes in this Northern California area. So that would be Western screech owls. They're small. They're they're like, I like to call them little Furbies. If you guys remember that toy, the Furby, um, they're, they're gonna use the um, kestrel nest boxes. So a uh, kestrel nest box and a Western screech owl nest box are kind of synonymous. And um, great horned owls actually, like I said, they're the bully of all the raptors. They actually take over old stick nests from other ravens or red-tailed hawks that are left that kind of survived that that year. And they start nesting really early and kind of take over those nests. And so they don't actually nest in cavities. So it's just the barn owl and the screech owl. Thank you. Are there signs we can look for to know um, there is a barn owl in the box? Yes, you can look for pellet debris. Sometimes those pellets get really messy and they spill out of the box. Sometimes the parents will be perched on top of the boxes and drop pellets around the box. Um, and you might see pellets and if there's weather, sometimes those get degraded and you just see bones. It's like a bone graveyard underneath um, the boxes. Uh, you can also look for um, you can also look inside of the box. So when you're cleaning out the nest boxes, if you see a floor filled with pellets, it's likely that there was breeding in there. Um, they can also be really important for roosting and pellets can accumulate that way. But if you see a really messy box with lots of pellets and debris, then that's a good indication that um, a box was nested in. And if you have questions about monitoring them, you can ask me, or if you um, look on the BOMPCO website, they also offer monitoring services in certain locations. So that could be an option as well. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, regarding Raptor perch in installation. Um, is it important to take the presence of power lines and wind turbines into consideration? Yes. So wind, tur wind turbines do present a perching substrate on often on the back of um, wind turbines. Um, for they can um, I see raptors perch on in those spots often. Um, but for really like really, really large wind turbines, they do uh, those are those are hazardous. So you wouldn't want to put a perch somewhere where a raptor would be flying in a direct line through the path of a wind turbine to get onto a perch or if they're getting off a perch. So I would keep them away from large wind turbines. I know there's some smaller ones in vineyards for um, like fog and things like that. Those are perches themselves and I know they're not always running and I don't think that those are as great of a hazard, um, but I, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, in terms of power lines, power those poles and those transmission towers, they provide excellent substrate for perching. Um, unfortunately, not all power lines are um, retrofitted to be safe for raptors, so they will still perch there anyways. Um, if the lines are less than three feet apart, um, or they're not blocked off from like being able to perch in an area where the lines are less than three feet apart, um, that can be dangerous, but there's not really much you can do. Um, you can use perches out in other areas and um, just make sure that they're not gonna be like in the line of, of a, a power line, but those are gonna be also be pretty high up above 15 feet, so. Um, I don't think there's very much you could do there. 
Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to move on to this question. I heard a report on NPR about barn owls sometimes attacking people. What might cause a barn owl to become aggressive towards humans? I that's a new one for me. I haven't heard of a I haven't heard of that. I will look it up after this. Um, I've heard so raptors in general can be territorial of their nests. And so um, sometimes like Cooper's hawks nesting in urban areas or red tailed hawks, they can um, kind of swoop down on someone if they're walking in the vicinity of their nest it is it can happen it's more rare typically if there is that human disturbance especially if it's constant typically they'll find a different place to nest um and so once it's happening if you do see a territorial raptor it's kind of good to block off that area so that someone doesn't unknowingly go in there they their nesting is protected so once their nest is started there isn't really much you can do um you could call animal services or well, yeah, animal control and things like that to see like what the options are. But um, but I haven't heard of the barn owl one, so I will look that up. Thank you. You know, someone else commented in the Q and A saying that the aggressive owls in the NPR article were actually ba bared owls or barred owls. Oh, okay, that makes sense because um, barred owls are going to be more aggressive and territorial. We're not going to find barn owls, barred owls nesting in nest boxes on farms. They're going to be in inside of forests. Great. Um, and then there's another question. Are there any grants or cost sharing programs available to growers for raptor box funding slash setup? That is a really good question and something that I wish I had more resources on, something I'm always looking out for. And um, if I do get any information or opportunities like that, I'm going to be sure to share and post out to these networks. Um, but in the future, I hope that there will be programs that support that. But as of now, I don't know any that I can cite offhand. I think that concludes the questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brianna. Yeah, thank you.